Olá, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Um bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa e estamos aqui mais uma vez para o McKinsey Talks. McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como um espaço para conversas ao vivo com os maiores expertos do mundo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios. E hoje nós vamos fazer uma sessão sobre como a transformação para a cloud tem gerado oportunidades e impacto para negócios e tecnologia. We have here with us today Leandro Santos and Justin Molden. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your experience in cloud transformation, please? Thank you, Denise. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I am Leandro Santos. I'm a senior partner with McKinsey and Company. I'm based in, in, uh, in Atlanta, in North America, originally from Brazil. So happy to uh, insert some of that Brazilian accent as we go along. Uh, but I'm based in Atlanta. I co-lead our cloud by McKinsey practice uh, in our infrastructure and cyber practices, which is where we do a lot of the work with our clients in their cloud transformations. So very glad to be here with you and be talking to some of our Brazilian friends. And I'm Justin Molden, associate partner and senior solution lead in the cloud by McKinsey practice. So I work with Leandro and the team uh, across multiple industries, leading cloud transformations, helping our clients with some of their most complex, most difficult uh, transformations. I come from uh, the industry uh, side of the equation, uh, led infrastructure and operations and uh, cloud and DevOps transformations for uh, multiple Fortune 500 companies. So happy to be doing that today for our, for McKinsey's clients, as well as speaking with you and, and the team today. Oh, thank you very much. Leandro, I'm going to start with you. Cloud is a buzz word that is not quite understood by all the clients. How would you define a cloud transformation and why it's generating so much traction in the business world today? It's a great question, Denise. Cloud is very much a technology, uh, it's very much a technology and a technology topic. But what is really different between cloud and, and previous technology chains and, and, and uh, technology that have been rolled out is that cloud fundamentally changed the paradigm on how technology is made available to the business. Uh, and to the internal IT teams. In the past, it used to be that you needed to buy a bunch of servers, you need to figure out a data center where you'd host them, you then need to buy and configure a bunch of software to put on that data center, tailor it to what the company needed to do to then be able to suit the business needs. That used to have a very long lead time, and it was always very uh, uh, limited in terms of what, you, what capabilities you're able to offer. If you hadn't planned to deploy a certain capability or make a certain capability available, by the time that that need came about, it meant you usually needed to go and buy additional servers, hope that you had space on that data center to put those there, buy additional software, learn and configure how to use them uh, and make it available. The difference with cloud is that all of that infrastructure, all of the data centers, the servers are already made available to everybody by the cloud service providers. And what I find to be most transformative is that it's not just the infrastructure, but all of the software that some of the leading technology uh, providers in the globe have used is immediately available and all of it available to you uh, as the needs arise. So if you didn't expect that you needed, for example, machine learning type of solution in your business application, the moment you do, that's already available to you in the cloud. And not just a run of the mill and average type of capability, but what some of the best of the, you know, someone like Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google or IBM or whoever, what they have created and what they use on their own uh, capabilities, that's all available to you. So what's really transformative about cloud and why it's gaining so much traction is the, the ability to impact business outcome and really drive uh, uh, business value. We have actually conducted a, a, a study along with McKinsey Global Institute uh, recently that talks about some of the ways that cloud can generate value for, uh, for the business. Uh, and what we have found is if you look at just the EBITDA margins for some of the Fortune 500 companies with a 15 uh, year horizon, 10 to 15 year horizon, uh, it has the potential to generate about a trillion dollars of uh, business value to them. Some of it is gonna be generated in form of uh, IT efficiency. So if you think of the, what we call rejuvenate, so how can you optimize the cost of IT because you can automate more things because you, you have uh, companies that have scale to deploy and manage those infrastructures as well as 
develop some of that uh, those services and, 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 and the new technology and keep up with it. Uh, some of it is going to be around risk reduction. Uh, again, those providers of technology are able to invest in cybersecurity and protection in ways that most uh, enterprise could not even dream of. Uh, the ability to digitize some of the core IT operations themselves, so automate a lot of what IT needed to do, because infrastructure essentially becomes software at this point. So that allows you to just automate and, and improve the way you operate IT. But what I again find more uh, exciting, even more exciting, is that twice as much value is there to be had on the business side in ways that technology now can, can enable the business to innovate. That could be uh, uh, in ways of driving additional growth uh, in the business side uh, to enabling some of those uh, enhanced use cases, and we'll, call, we'll talk about some of them today. It could be around accelerating product development. There is a very meaningful uh, uh, difference in terms of the lead time to deploy technology, to change technology, to respond to changing business needs when you're doing it on the cloud versus, again, on the old model that I described earlier. Or whether it's the ability to scale, like you might be able to launch a new service that you didn't know if it was going to take off or not. When you are operating and, and running that on the cloud, you're able to scale to as big as it needs to get, as fast as it needs to. Uh, again, something that was virtually impossible to do, or at least extremely hard to do in a cost-effective way before. Uh, and then there is a third dimension that we see uh, also extremely exciting uh, that's harder to quantify or to put a number on, but, but cloud ultimately enables traditional enterprise to pioneer and to really test new business models that are enabled by some of this technology that again, up until recently, uh, was only available to some of the leading uh, companies in, in the Valley, right, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so because of all of that is, is why we are seeing it really be not just a technology, but a, but a technology plus or a technology driven business transformation is the way I would describe. So just to add on there, I want to give a few quick examples of uh, where we've seen these types of transformations occur. So um, early in, in our history, we uh, worked with a, a very large consumer packaged goods uh, company who uh, had, had a need to divest itself of, of data centers. This is kind of a classic infrastructure focused uh, play for cloud here. Um, tremendous uh, OPEX reduction and simplification benefits to be had there in that sort of rejuvenation space. Uh, by moving to the cloud, migrating existing applications and sunsetting uh, uh, legacy ones, very often organizations can achieve very significant cost takeouts, um, which is great. And it's really great for the bottom line and, and helping to streamline IT. But as we move forward into more of these innovative types of, of use cases, uh, a good example of that is you know, a payments processor that we've worked with. Um, able to really kind of take over and capture market share in their space by utilizing cloud technology scalability, uh, the ability to rapidly handle transaction processing workloads that previously took days or, or at least hours in the past, um, really able to, to push those capabilities out into the cloud and utilize uh, the cloud service providers, massive scalability, high performance and availability to, to tackle those new workloads. And then, you know, as we, we've uh, grown and, and our clients have grown, um, you know, recently worked with a global uh, analytics processing company uh, in the consumer credit space um, to help to understand and, and gain insights to existing data and systems, uh, reduce their ability or their cost rather, and the time required uh, to bring new, new services and products to the marketplace and really change the way that consumers think about credit reporting and management of their, their own uh, credit journey. Um, so just a few examples of, of uh, use cases that we have seen across all of these dimensions. Um, each is very important in its own right, but as we drive uh, maturity and adoption further to the right, we start to see that true unlock of, of new capabilities that redefines markets and, uh, and redefines people's expectations of what can be done with technology. Thank you, Justin. Those are some good examples. Indeed, but what about data security in the cloud? Is yeah. cloud yet secure enough to host financial services transactions, Justin? 
Yeah, certainly been the case in the past. There's been a lot of sort of spectacular and, and well publicized breaches and problems that people have had uh, on the cloud and losing access to data, um, you know, kind of embarrassing uh, uh, exposure of personal data, things like that. Really what that comes down to is an inability or, or not sufficiently utilizing cloud technology in the right way. The reality is uh, cloud and its automation capabilities and observability characteristics make it far more securable. The important factor is that you utilize those capabilities in the right way. Um, something like 85, 90% of those breaches that you see really come down to misconfiguration. Um, in reality, the level of clarity when properly implemented on, a, on an end-to-end -end basis allows us to understand not just on a point in time or sort of audit basis whether or not we're secure, but on an ongoing and continuous basis prior to ever even inter, you know, deploying data and workloads into the environment in the first place. Yeah, I think those are, are uh, great examples and that's what we see um, uh, very consistently. The vast majority of the breach, like Justin said, are due to misconfiguration and how that's being used in the cloud. Leandro, cloud seems to be now a very mature technology, but we see a number of cloud transformation struggling to get the expected results. Why? That's very much true. And I think that while it is mature, it's still maturing. Uh, what we have found is that uh, in, in some estimates, as many as 70% of cloud programs fail in one way or another. The three most common aspects or ways that we have found is either the program installs, the impact is not delivered, or actually it ends up costing more than what was expected or the IT costs themselves go up. Uh, the, the reason for the program install and delay oftentimes have to do with their ability to mobilize uh, the organization and to bring in the talent uh, and to find the right mechanism on how, uh, how to go about doing the program. This is, at the end of the day, a very different capability that's required from the organization. Like Justin talked about some of the security breach, that applies to other ways on how uh, software is developed and how infrastructure is, is deployed. So it requires an ecosystem of new partners that you need to work with, not just the cloud service providers, but others that are bringing different areas of expertise, whether it's to train your people in cloud, to bring in new skills, to advise you on the path that, that it needs to take. And that's something that, that uh, not everybody plans for or don't always have the right set of uh, partners to go through that journey. And that then ends up with some failures early, early on that then creates a skepticism within the organization and just slows everything down. So that's been one failure mode that we've seen fairly consistently. The second one is around the business impact not realized. Like I said earlier, yes, there are IT savings to be had, and we do believe that cloud can be a more effective way of running IT infrastructure and IT overall, but the real benefit will come from that business enablement. And that requires a partnership between technology and the business. And it also requires for the business to be willing to reinvent itself on how it does things. And it could be small things as in how do I run a, a journey for a certain process internally, but it could also be big things in terms of which services I bring to market. So those programs that tend to focus strictly on cost savings within infrastructure, uh, we found that that tend to struggle more. In some cases, that's sufficient to make the business case. In a lot of times, uh, it's not. And you really need to look at what is going to be the additional benefit outside of infrastructure within the overall IT operations, but then uh, most importantly on the business side. So that's a second failure mode. And then a third one is cloud. An important change in terms of the paradigm, uh, again, on cloud is that in traditional IT, you buy, you lease that data center, you can build that data center, you buy those servers, you buy the software, and you know upfront how much it is that you're spending on each one. And then it's about uh, uh, capitalizing and depreciating that over time. So it's very predictable. Uh, in terms of what you're going to spend. It's fixed. It takes a lot of that upfront investment, but it's predictable once you get over that hurdle. With cloud, a lot of these models are pay as you go. So the way I described it, capabilities are available and you can tap into them as needs arise. Uh, that also means that you pay for it. So if you don't have the right awareness on what the cloud costs, and if you don't have the right governance uh, internally and transparency to the IT team to the technology team, as well as to the business. And you're making those decisions on a true ROI basis. Like, is it worth accessing that new machine learning capability because of the benefits it's gonna to create to the business? 
uh, it's very easy that the engineers will be carried away and will be using all of this new technology and will be allocating resource in a less than efficient way. And so it will end up costing more. Again, same way that client that cloud is more securable, meaning you can make it more secure than traditional. Cloud can be more cost effective if done right. But if not done right, then you can have runaway costs as several companies have experienced. Justin, for companies that have, have already started their cloud journeys and are facing challenges, what can they do successfully scale this transformation? Yeah. Great question. Um, it is certainly the case that uh, just about everybody these days is doing something on the cloud, right? Um, and and very often, you know, it's it's there's a tacit agreement or or understanding that yes, we have a cloud strategy, but when we see them fail, it tends to be that the strategy itself has not necessarily uh, achieved the right breadth or business context that's needed. Um, so very often, what we see to Leandro's prior point, lots of cloud uh, provisions, not a lot of business impact. Um, so. Really what we advocate and what we very often help our clients to do is really kind of step back and look at, okay, in the broad context of what's needed, not just from a technical perspective, but also from um, an overall operating model, what are, the, what are the impacts to how I do business as an IT organization? What are the right security and risk management postures, regulatory compliance needs, et cetera, that to be met in order to ensure that things rapidly and, and safely transition into production? Um, and actually begin to realize that business value. And then overall, what are the economics? How do I think about managing uh, the, the uh, consumption of cloud resources, the staffing, uh, the enablement, ensuring that I'm getting good ROI on that and being able to do that in a way that is iterative, that rapidly achieves value without se seeking to boil the ocean is really kind of how we help our clients to, uh, to reset their cloud programs, fill in the gaps, understand where are the missing pieces, and reorient expectations uh, to, to more optimally position them towards success. And Leandro, is the cloud transformation a matter of technology teams only? Well, if you've been paying attention so far, you know, no. <laughs> Denise, what I mean by that is uh, obviously it does need to be a partnership between the technology teams and the business with also three very important supporting functions in finance, HR, and procurement or vendor management. Uh, between the business and IT in terms of understanding what is the value that you're ultimately going to be releasing with cloud? Uh, what is the impact you're going to be creating? And finding those use cases, like Justin said, that allows you to put some points on the board early on and then iterate. Iterate on building your capabilities and increasing the impact that you're delivering. So that does take a sound strategy up front, and it's a strategy uh, in terms of what you are how you're, you're using cloud, how you're building your capabilities, but also what parts of the business you are, you are engaging and what you are creating and delivering to the business. Finding a counterpart on the business side that is really willing uh, and sees the value and is willing to, to work with, with the technology team as uh, that journey unfolds, because it will be a learning journey and, and it, it will require adjustments on both sides. Finance plays an extremely important role because oftentimes cloud will actually lead to additional costs on the IT side because uh, in order to release some benefits on the business side. So making sure that, that the total financial impact is being taken into account and not just that we're going to be expecting lower IT costs and that's it. So as you work through, uh, on both sides of that equation, on the business benefit and on the, the impact in IT, that finance is, is uh, informing and is being informed of those chains. I talked about the change from capital uh, expenditure towards an operating expense. Uh, that's another important element that finance needs to understand and guide the teams through it. And finance is then oftentimes going to be involved uh, in managing the cloud spend. And like I said, putting the right governance and the process and capabilities in place so that as you go to a pay-as-you-go model, you are managing that. HR is a critical partner in this. Like I said, this is a capability building. It will require retraining a lot of the workforce. It will require uh, also recruiting uh, new talent outside. So that partnership is gonna be critical. And these are areas that HR has not necessarily done in the past. So they will also need to learn what are the types of profiles to look for, what are, what are the new training sessions that are needed and whatnot. And vendor management is another uh, important stakeholder because like I mentioned at the beginning, it requires a different ecosystem than the company has likely worked with in the past. Uh, so new partners, new vendors, and new ways of engaging these vendors. 
uh, new SLAs that you're going to work with them. So if procurement has traditionally just been about running the RFPs and getting to contract, they will also need to develop capabilities of vendor, true vendor management and partner management uh, to work with this new ecosystem uh, as the journey unfolds and, and as new uh, needs arise also. And Justin, what's the impact of a cloud transformation on technology, talent, and culture, and how the clients can handle it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty massive. Um, the reality is, um, you know, cloud's not magic, right? Um, it's, still, it's still infrastructure. There's a common, common joke that it's just uh, your stuff running on someone else's computer, which is partially true, but the reality is the way that we do business as IT organizations and often the way that businesses functions need to change in many unforeseen ways. Um, so existing jobs, existing capabilities, things like database administration, software development, architecture, they all need to take place, but they all need to happen in a different way in order to best, best take advantage of the capabilities of cloud. And so that requires shifts and blending of existing job roles, job functions, and the incorporation of new methods, new technology, et cetera. And so uh, in addition to that, there's tremendous demand for talent uh, for cloud these days, since everyone's sort of uh, experimenting or, or charging headlong towards it. And so it requires that organizations think differently about how they structure their teams, how they train their people, how they attract new, time, new talent, and how they partner with others in order to make sure that they're successfully enabling their organization. And all of this requires you know, top-down focus uh, from the IT organization and even from the business side of the leadership equation to understand that things are going to have to change. We'll have to organize differently and we'll have to think differently about how work flows through. And can you give us an example of a cloud transformation where the cultural aspects and relationship between business and technology were key to success? Yeah, absolutely. So um, thinking about a travel and transportation client of ours, um, the kind of the classic story, and this is common across multiple industries, is that IT had really been sort of an order taker, um, sort of a, a service provider to the business. Uh, on more of a request and respond sort of basis. So we need X number of widgets and then the, the IT organization would, would provide that and really more of a kind of throw things over the wall approach. Um, it worked well in the, the 90s, I suppose, but uh, in, in this new way of, of uh, delivering things very rapidly and rapid experimentation, it requires that we be much closer. So in this case, uh, by working through and performing a, a reset and, and really helping the business to realize that this is a two-part equation, strengthen the bonds between the technology organization and the, uh, the delivery side or, or the, the business side, and uh, in, ended up incorporating uh, business leaders into the technology organization and architects and engineers into the business side and really kind of shorten the feedback loops and increase the speed and the quality of the work that was being done. And Leandro, what, what is public and private cloud and how can clients extract most value from the multiple cloud services providers? That's a great question and, and one that oftentimes confuse, uh, especially the business side uh, of, of, uh, of, of companies. Um, public cloud is usually referred to or is referred to when the infrastructure, so the data center, the servers that I talked about is provided by, uh, by a third party uh, that's running that infrastructure in what we would call a multi-tenant kind of way. So the same infrastructure is being shared or being used by several different companies. So it's not exclusive to you. So it's provided by some, somebody else, managed by somebody else and shared uh, amongst other enterprise. That's usually referred to some of the hyperscalers like uh, Amazon uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure and Google uh, GCP. Uh, as well as others uh, in other geographies and, and, and other providers like uh, you know, IBM, Oracle, SAP, who also provide uh, services in that manner, not to be extens uh, uh, um, extensive, not, not to be exhausted in terms of the, the companies that, that I'm naming, and certainly not to <laughs> uh, bias uh, towards one or the other. But, but that's, that's what public cloud is at the end of the day. Private cloud is when uh, an enterprise uh, manage their own data center, their own servers, and use the software to create an abstraction across those uh, servers. So you have some of the benefits in terms of shifting workloads or reallocating some of your capacity to different workloads, depending on, on your own internal variability. 
uh, but you were still pre, uh, pre-purchasing, pre-allocating, pre-defining your capacity. Um, and it does not have those more advanced services that are inherently available through the hyperscalers, for example, machine learning, artificial intelligence, those types of services, and even uh, several others, for example, services around e-commerce, around voice recognition, things like that, that the hyperscalers are developing. Usually in a private cloud setup, you wouldn't have, certainly not the richness that you can get on a private setup. You will also hear the term hi- uh, um, hybrid cloud. You, hit, you will also hear the term hybrid cloud, which is a model where part of your infrastructure will be on that public cloud and part of it is gonna be on your own private cloud, the privately managed. Uh, that's a model that we expect we're gonna see for foreseeable future for any enterprise with large complexity. Uh, and certainly a model that's gonna be used as enterprises are shifting from a private only towards uh, a eventually uh, public only model. But it's a model where certain workloads that have higher affinity to public cloud, meaning uh, uh, higher resiliency required, uh, more scalability uh, that needs some of those services that are not available internally will run on the public cloud. And some of the ones that perhaps uh, companies are either don't have as much of the affinity, for example, some of the legacy technology that's harder to migrate, or because the companies or the local uh, regulation prevents them from moving to the public cloud, or at least they are not as clear on what it would take to, to move on a, a public cloud. So that's, that's a model where you're using parts in the public and parts in the private, uh, usually as an interim or at least as a, a, a state as companies move towards that public uh, model. And just think, there are many different cloud services and tools being launched every day. How do companies can keep up with the technology that is really relevant? Yeah, that's one of the uh, one of the the biggest frustrations uh, for organizations that are that are sort of new to cloud is keeping up with the rapid level of innovation that's happening in the space. Uh, so these organizations are massive and investing billions of dollars in research and development and de- delivery of new uh, products and services into the cloud platforms and making them available. So really understanding uh, which ones do I need to be focusing on and, and how do I need to think about those is a, is a significant challenge. Now, one of the big benefits of making these kinds of transitions is that by divesting yourself of the need to perform an inordinate amount of engineering and, and architecture on underlying infrastructure services, you're now able to free up your architecture, your architects, engineers, and other technology professionals to be more future focused and more, again, the closer relationship with the business. By leveraging that understanding, um, we are now, we're, I'm sorry, let me step back. By leveraging that understanding, organizations are able to kind of project forward and and utilize the automation capabilities to rapidly test develop the right uh, strategies and the right control frameworks around these services and make those available to their their own organization. So it really is a combination of maintaining currency and focus on the the, uh, differentiating capabilities of the cloud and how that is relevant to your organization. Leandri, Dustin, any final words for the clients engaging in the cloud transformation? Starting with you, Leandri. Um, look, I think this is this can be a this can be somewhat scary to start. Uh, it can also feel like a shiny object where uh, you can jump in without any caution. Uh, what I would encourage is don't don't be in either one of those modes. Don't be scared uh, or too scared where you wouldn't try, and don't be too excited where you're going to jump in heads first. I think my advice is this is absolutely a technology that is transforming already uh, the business world. If you look at just last year, a 3D, 3D pandemic that all of us had to manage, companies that had used, that had already migrated to the cloud, fared much better than those that did not. They were able to scale both up and down, depending on where their demand uh, varied. They were able to change their systems to uh, uh, respond to user demands, to changing user needs, for example, through more self-service, through more remote uh, working conditions than those that, again, did not have it. So it's, it's an extremely valuable technology. Uh, I think every company should consider, should, be, uh, should figure out where it's going to create the most value, but also should be thoughtful, should uh, seek the right uh, counsel and advice on, on how to make the transition and approach it carefully and, and with, with a strategy that makes sense for 
each one of them. There is no one, one size fits all approach here. I would just echo uh, Leandro's sentiment there. Um, it, is, it is a broad and complex topic. Um, and there, it is certainly easy to, to get hung up in a lot of the analysis. It is extremely important that you have the right strategy and approach, but it's important that that strategy and approach enable quick action and fast uh, iteration through uh, the transformation cycle. So working in a small enough context that allows you to understand the business value at stake for your organization, the right cloud architectures to be used, the right technical constructs and services, uh, what the impacts are to your overall operating model as an IT organization, how that affects the business. Again, how we secure and manage that uh, from a risk perspective. And then ultimately, how am I going to work these changes through the organization, right? Build that momentum and, and build velocity. Those are really kind of the key elements to, to being successful in cloud transformations without suffering a lot of the same sort of drawbacks, stalls, or, or misses in terms of business value and desired outcomes. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's go now to, to questions from the audience. The First question, Leandro, is for you. If cloud is a business initiative, how should we reimagine the role of IT units in CIOs to be effective in this initiative? That's a very good question. And uh, as I think we touched on some elements, Justin talked about the example of the, the company that had uh, to really change a posture rather than being order takers and, and delivering certain widgets uh, to one of really kind of partnering and developing uh, with, the, with the business. Uh, I think that to add, that, to, add to that, uh, also we've seen in the last three to five years, some enterprise separating what would be, uh, what they would call a digital unit or having a CDO or chief digital officer as a separate organization from the IT or the CIO, the chief information officer. Uh, we find it extremely hard for that model to work when you're talking about cloud because cloud, uh, if seen by the CIO, it becomes just an infrastructure replacement. If seen by the CDO, it, it becomes a way of bypassing the traditional, the traditional IT and the, the, the legacy systems. Uh, and that then limits uh, the, 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 the surface of the impact that you can have with cloud. So I think one of the changes is you really need to think through how is technology enabling the business? How are we digitizing the business? And how cloud then uh, comes into that equation. So bringing digital uh, IT and also the, the analytics, the, the, the data analytics capabilities together, uh, not necessarily organizationally, but at least thinking about all of them in, in a combined way, along with the cyber capabilities with a lot of companies have it separate often, uh, bringing all of that together and then uh, taking a product uh, uh, mindset in working with the business. What are the products that we're going to create together for the business uh, that are going to have the fancy, uh, uh, exciting digital front end that's going to have the, re the resiliency from being built and, and being able to interact with all of our core systems, uh, for being able to uh, have the right intelligence through the data analytics and the data we have uh, and, and do all of that in a safe way. So bring all of those modalities together as again, an integrated stack uh, of capabilities that are being uh, developed uh, jointly with the business. Justin, question for you. From your experience, can you talk about a client example where they exceeded the, uh, their impact from the cloud initiative and what they did? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of one of our classic uh, use cases, working with a, a large consumer packaged goods client. Um, initial forays into cloud, you know, coming from a, a very well-established and long-held IT estate and, and way of doing business, um, decided to, to utilize cloud for a marketing website in response to a major marketing event. So kind of a classic uh, cloud use case of uh, rapidly, the system of, of uh, advertisement, just, just get the word out there and wildly successful uh, in a way uh, not, not imagined before, led to additional uh, sort of um, uh, experimentation. Uh, taking a little bit bigger risks and moving into more of a, a collaborative and, and bi-directional uh, interaction with their clients. Also successful, fast forward about five years, the same organization started out just toe dipping with marketing, 
ultimately decides to move their entire IT estate to the cloud, inclusive of their uh, mainframe systems, legacy data warehouse, um, you know, everything, and entirely got out of the data center business. Um, it's an example of how by overachieving on sort of the, the initial uh, rounds through, you kind of start to reimagine the business and, and what, what's possible with cloud. Leandro, in your perspective, what is the typical timeline to start seeing financial and business results from a cloud journey? Another good question. Uh, look, the, that, that answer really varies depending on what the company is doing. I think the example that Justin uh, just gave, such an application can be developed and deployed in a couple of months, right? Two to three months, and you're immediately delivering business impact. But we're not talking about migrating or converting everything that the company has to the cloud. That journey will definitely take longer. Uh, some organizations uh, will get to, to the state that they want to get to or the amount of, of uh, uh, applications that they're willing to migrate at, at this point in a couple of years, a year and a half, uh, between a year and a half and three years, I would say. Uh, others that, that really decide to migrate and, and convert everything, that can easily be a three to five year journey to get to the end, but that's to get to the end. I think in order to get to the impact, we believe that if you set your targets on anything that's longer than nine to 12 months, uh, the business is gonna move, uh, they are gonna lose uh, focus uh, and that, that by itself is gonna create issues. So the art is finding those uh, use case that you can actually deliver the impact, if not as quickly as a two to three months, like the example that, that Justin just gave, uh, but like on the six month type of timeline so that you can create some positive momentum within the organization, create the excitement very much like the company that Justin described uh, to then iterate and, and, and build on those, uh, on those. If you try to do it all, uh, the old strategy of the building they will come uh, tends to be too long of a journey and uh, too much investment upfront uh, to really work on the, on, on the long term. So that iterative quicker uh, impact, uh, we find it to be much more effective. Justin, what are the biggest risks in a cloud journey? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a common theme uh, with the, the rest of, of the, the, the discussion so far, but, but really the, the biggest risks, the things that we've seen be most impactful in a negative sense uh, to our clients' cloud journeys, either moving too fast or moving too slow, right? And so moving too fast, there's tremendous ability, there's tremendous power in the automation capability presented by cloud. Um, that power, if not wielded properly, can lead to things like catastrophic data breaches and very embarrassing sort of loss of good faith from your, your customers, as well as real damages to people um, through, through the loss of data. Um, in addition, cost overruns by not effectively controlling and understanding what you're doing can very rapidly you know, skyrocket costs if, if things aren't, aren't managed properly. Um, on the other side of the equation, not moving fast enough or not understanding the, the deep and broad impacts can lead to stagnation within the organization, extreme dissatisfaction within the organization, and actually can cause a lot of attrition or, or at least strife and, and distraction that can have uh, cross-cutting impacts across multiple uh, uh, kind of domains. Um, so really understanding the, the breadth, the importance, um, ensuring that, that you are moving with speed, but not too much haste uh, and, and taking the right precautionary measures to, to control things as they move are, are really critical to mitigating those risks. So thank you very much, Justin, Leandro, muito obrigada. Obrigada a você que também nos acompanhou de casa, a todo mundo que mandou as perguntas, vocês que ficaram aqui os últimos minutos com a gente, muitíssimo obrigada. Para conhecer a agenda completa do McKinsey Talks, acesse maquinstocks.com. Lá você pode assistir aos episódios anteriores e na segunda-feira, o episódio de hoje vai estar também liberado lá. E vocês também encontram acesso para as versões em áudio disponíveis no Spotify. Muito obrigada pela companhia, bom fim de semana e até a próxima. Tchau, tchau.